Today, we're doing this webinar on uh, establishing stretch goals. This is one of the most impactful competencies we've ever measured. And uh, we find that people, you know, kind of have a love-hate relationship with it. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about that. And, uh, but this is an exciting webinar. I think you're going to find some great insights on this because we have, have the keys for setting stretch goals and helping you to do that. Uh, I'm joined today by my good friend and partner, Jack Zinger. Jack, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. My pleasure to be here. Yeah. It's good to see you, and as always. And uh, also, we have with us Tracy Consolini, uh, Regional Vice President. Uh, she's got some information she's going to share at the end of the webinar. Tracy, how are you today? Good, Joe. Good to be here and looking forward to sharing some information and a special offer at the end of the webinar with everyone. Thank you, Tracy. And we also have Jill Mancini. She's a regional vice president, and she's going to be our chat host. Uh, Jill, what, what are you going to help people with today on chat? Well, they can be as chatty as they want. We look forward to hearing questions and comments, and I will make sure uh, that you're connected with the right resource at the end of the webinar. So thanks for participating. Jill will answer all the hard questions. <laughs> all right. Well, let's begin by talking, uh, what are the objectives today of the webinar, Jack? You bet. So the objectives of today's session are, first of all, to help you understand the importance of this topic and uh, why, why the, the ability to set stretch goals has such a, a pervasive influence on so many other uh, leadership competencies. Secondly, we're going to talk about different approaches that people have to setting stretch goals. Uh, we want to talk about the results that you, you, you've gonna generated from taking the self-assessment. And finally, as always, we'd like to have you leave with maybe just one thing in mind that you might work on to help you become even more effective at setting stretch goals. Uh, to begin, we'd like to ask you a question. Um, they're posted on the screen in front of you, uh, and we're going to ask you if you would to kind of weigh in with your answers to these three alternatives. Is setting stretch goals one of the top four most important competencies? Or maybe is it one of the top 10 uh, of the most important competencies? Or finally, is it really not all that important in my, in my job? Uh, so please, if you would, uh, jump in and let us know kind of your reaction to uh, those three alternative choices. Uh, and we'll give you kind of a moment or two to log in and make your, give us your vote. And let's see if we can um, see our results. Um, What's your guess, Joe? What do you think? People see it as in the top 10? <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Uh, well, you know, so we have a biased sample here. We have people that signed up for the webinar, right? <laughs> and, and so, of course, you know, they're going to say that. They're, they're going to say, oh, yes, this is, this is pretty good. But let me show you the data because this is really interesting. Uh, we, we did this analysis, and this is from 1.6 million people, so it's not a small sample. Uh, but we asked people which competencies were most important. We, the, we listed 19, and then we said select the top four that are most important to you. And you can see there that learning agility was actually rated number and number uh, 17, uh, and, and that's, that's discouraging. Um, well, and stretch goals was, you know, setting stretch goals was number 16. Oh, it was 16, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and agility was 17. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong one. Thank you. And, and so 16th out of 19, that's not very good. And I was thinking about what the problem is here, why people um, – don't think it's important or resist it. 
a little bit. And we have a, another survey where we measured your preference for setting stretch goals. And we also measured the extent to which people uh, sometimes feel overwhelmed, okay? And so the horizontal axis uh, represents the preference from low preference, bottom 10%, to really high preference, top 10%. And then the vertical bars, the, they represent the extent to which you feel overwhelmed. And what you see there is if, if you're in the bottom 10%, low preference, you know, those people had 86%, average 86% felt overwhelmed. <laughs> now, you know, when you feel overwhelmed and somebody asks you, would you like to do something really difficult? <laughs> no. <laughs> so that, you know, that's, that is, a, you know, what you'd expect, right? And, and so one of the things that gets in the way of this is, is people's sense that, that you know, they, they feel overwhelmed. And, and it's interesting, when we looked at who felt most overwhelmed, it wasn't top managers or senior managers, it was supervisors. Now, Jack, you're a CEO. <laughs> do, you, do you think you have more on your, uh, you think you have more on your plate than most supervisors? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's certainly more complexity uh, on the plate of a person in senior management, but uh, it, that's fascinating that it's the supervisors who feel like they're overwhelmed. Well, and, and, and you know, I think part of feeling overwhelmed isn't, you know, people think, well, that's the amount of work you have to do, right, or the complexity of things. And, and I think it has a lot to do with control uh, and, and other things that are going on in your life. But as you think about that, I, I, I talked to a group once and they said, you know, every time we, our boss goes to a meeting, we stop him at the door before he leaves the room and we say, don't agree to anything, <laughs> right? Because he'd always come or she'd always come back from a meeting and, and they'd say, well, now we've, we've gotten to do more. Uh, you know, it's interesting, though, the effect of uh, setting stretch goals because, you uh, when we looked at differentiating competencies, now that's how we determine if a competency is a good competency, right? And what I'm showing you on this graph are two of our differentiating competencies. And I've got the one that differentiates, uh, uh, you know, one of the least differentiating, and it's still highly differentiating. And then I've got stretch goals in the blue there. And what's interesting about a differentiating competency, if you do it well, it impacts lots of other things. So the, the thing we're impacting here is overall leadership effectiveness. And what you see in the graph there is that if you have a low score on setting stretch goals, you're actually, you know, uh, your overall leadership effectiveness rating, which is overall how you're perceived as a leader, is rated basically eight points lower uh, because of that, then, then uh, this least differentiating competency. And then if you score really well, you're, you're scored three points higher. Now, that's the idea of differentiating competencies. And what we found is that some competencies don't differentiate at all. When we looked at the best and worst leaders, the, you know, they didn't impact that at all. So a differentiating competency can have a tremendous impact on how you're perceived as a leader. And to, to demonstrate that a little bit, we looked at your, your ability to set stretch goals, and then we looked at the percent of people that are willing to go the extra mile, right? And if you score low on that, you only have 18% of your employees, of your direct reports, willing to go the extra mile. But if you score high on it in the top quartile, 56%, over half of your people are willing to go the extra mile. And, and you know, that has a tremendous impact on how that group feels, right? If the majority of people are willing to put in more effort and, and spend more time and stay late and do those things, that's really going to affect productivity in the group. But one of the things that people worry about, managers worry about, is they worry that if they bring stretch goals to their employees, the engagement's gonna go down. Now, this is a key learning. You know, employees aren't more happy when they do less. <laughs> They're not more engaged when they have less to do. The reality is 
they're more engaged when they accomplish something significant. That, that is the key to engagement. And what you see here is that, that the most engaged employees, if you're in the top 25% on establishing stretch goals, the engagement level of those employees was at the 72nd percentile. Now the worst leaders, 30th percentile. I, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so let's just kind of step back and just summarize what we've, what we've concluded. Uh, this specific skill of setting stretch goals was seen by all those respondents, those more than a million that Joe talked about, is not, not very high on their list. But what we're saying is that it seems to have a catalytic effect in the way it impacts everything else. And so leaders who had low, school, low skills at setting stretch goals had their overall leadership effectiveness seriously deflated, whereas those who, who did set stretch goals effectively found that that really impacted not only the productivity of their direct reports, but also the engagement scores of their direct reports. And so there's this interesting quality about setting stretch goals uh, that uh, was a kind of a surprise to me at least. It really does have an impact, Jack. And to demonstrate a little bit of the impact of setting stretch goals, we wanted to look at how it affected another competency. So look at two competencies, strategic perspective. Now, nobody doubts the importance of that. That's really pretty high on the list and looking at stretch goals. So, so here's what we did. We looked at people who were in the top quartile on setting stretch goals, but below that on strategic perspective. And then we looked at the leaders at the 90th percentile, the best leaders in our database. So the probability that you'd be a great leader if you were good at A, but not at B is 3%. <laughs> and then you look at the opposite. You look at, well, wonder if you were good at strategic perspective, but not at setting stretch goals. Surely this is gonna be better, but it's not, it's the same, it's 3%. 3% chance of being a great leader if you're good at strategic perspective, but not at stretch goals. So wonder if you're good at both. If you're at the 75th percentile on both, uh, you'd expect 6%, but what you actually get is 94%. And that's what we call a powerful combination when you put these two things together. I mean, a strategy is terrific, being clear about where you're going, but a strategy that just incrementally gets you ahead or, or maybe even doesn't, but just gets you even with the competition, that's not as effective as a strategy that's gonna make a huge difference to the company. And that's what stretch goals can do for you. Okay, we'd now like to have you participate with us in taking one more poll. Uh, where is it in your career as you think back, as you reflect back over your, your life so far, uh, what kind of experience provided you with a better opportunity for learning and growing? One, an assignment where you had you know, pretty much all the skills necessary and you were able to kind of polish or enhance your existing skills. Two, an assignment where you needed to learn a few new things, but you were you know, reasonably comfortable or three, an assignment where you were challenged significantly and really had to quickly learn. So if you would kind of give us your reaction to those three choices, uh, where you gained the most, where, which provided a better learning and growth opportunity for you. You know, Jack, we, in, in, our, in our workshops, that we used to do. <laughs> yeah. We ask people about this and, and it's interesting, you know, the results on this is you can see 74% say it's the assignment, the challenging, that's, that's where they really learned. And, you know, we call that an, ex, you know, this extraordinary experience and, and people really, really do learn a lot from these challenging experiences. Uh, one of the things that's, that's fascinating is um, some organizations have got caught on this a little bit. And our good friend, Kevin Wilde, he talked a lot about this idea of testing a leader by giving them an impossible assignment, <laughs> you know, throwing them in the deep end of the pool. 
And, and, you know, and then they didn't give them any support. They just throw them in the deep end. They give them a really challenging assignment. If they succeeded, you know, they go, oh, okay, this guy's got potential. If they didn't, they kind of feel they could figure they didn't. And Kevin was always saying, you know, everybody needs a safety net. Everybody needs good coaching. Everybody needs support when they're given that challenging assignment. And I, I think that's, uh, that is important and, and clearly it makes a difference in how people do. Yeah. We mentioned earlier that we were we would be talking about different approaches that people use to set stretch goals. Uh, and the first dimension that we'd like to kind of present and have you think about with us is those people who lean toward being a protector of their colleagues versus those who lean to our, on the side of being a challenger. The protector is the one who says, you know, I've got my employee's best interests at heart. Don't want to push people too hard, too far. Too far. Uh, I want to make my folks feel comfortable. Uh, I, I observe when people are stressed and I, I worry about when people are overwhelmed. That's the employee protector. On the other hand, the employee challenger is a person who says, you know, I really want my people to, to achieve more. And I want to be sure that they feel challenged, that they move at a brisk pace. And they. And I like to challenge other people. Um, and so chances are, as you think about yourself, you would kind of say, I, I lean, you know, one direction or the other. Do I protect the people I work with and pre people who report to me? Or do I really like to challenge them? The consequences uh, of those uh, two approaches are, you know, on the, on the downside, performance can decline when a protector fails to challenge the employees so that they don't then perform to their peak level, or when employees feel like they are really being kind of coddled, that they're, they're being protected so much uh, that they are in, in this cocoon. On the other hand, the, the employee challengers run into trouble sometimes when people feel like they've been pushed too hard and the manager is perceived as being kind of a slave driver taskmaster. Hence, the employees feel like they're abused or you know, not being treated fairly. Joe? Yeah, we had a lot of fun with this because uh, it, we, when we were thinking about this, you know, I really thought that the people that would be the best at setting stretch goals would be the challengers, right? And so what we did is we turned to the data and we looked at people who were good at protecting and those that were good at challenging. And, and what you see here on this graph is the low, low group. They were you know, bottom quartile on both challenging and protecting. And then we looked at the effectiveness of setting stretch goals. That's the bars there. And you can see that, that if you're low on both, you're at the 13th percentile. So if you just did one well, which one gets you more? Is it low challenge, high protect? That's the 42nd percentile or low protect, high challenge. And you can see that if you were just doing one well, challenge, the challengers were better, were, were perceived better at setting stretch goals, but the better was only the 57th percentile. That's not great. But what surprised us was when people did both well, you know, their ability to kind of set stretch goals was the 88th percentile. And, and, you know, not only was their effectiveness at setting stretch goals, but this whole issue of discretionary effort, that, that willingness of people to go the extra mile, you can see that, again, it's the people that did both well that, that really had the highest scores there. And I, that's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah very much. So the famous push me, pull you uh, uh, animal from Dr. Doolittle's uh, tales. Uh, we, we thought this was a very useful metaphor uh, to, to use uh, because I think it, it teaches an important lesson. And, and that is, for those of you who remember the, the story or saw the movie, uh, it can only go one direction at a time that they both can't be working simultaneously. So they kind of have to take turns. So 
there's a time for push me and there's a time for pull you. Uh, and we think that there's a very important metaphor in there uh, about what we as leaders need, need to do and can do in terms of doing these, both of these well. Uh, as we saw from the previous data, it's when you did both well that you got, you got the highest scores. But that means maybe you need to kind of alternate them, take turns using the right approach at the right time in the right situation with the right, with the right people. Joe, what, what are your observations about push me, pull you? I think we can all remember a time when um, we really felt a manager had our back. And, you know, because they had our back, we were willing to do more and, 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 and we felt that support, right? Yeah. But we also know, you know, <laughs> this is funny. We, you need to hug people and you need to kick them in the rear end occasionally, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's just, you, you know, that, that kind of that push part. And, and we all need that push. We, we think we don't. But we do. We, we, we do better when, we, when there's a little push and we're, you know, we're out there a little bit and we try hard. Uh, now, we want to talk about another uh, issue, and that's kind of the optimum way to set stretch goals. And we'd like to introduce this with two examples. Now, the first example is a story I heard of a CEO. He was running a fairly large company. He decided that they needed to cut costs by 15%. And th he was very, very stuck on 15%. And so what he did is he went to all department managers. He said, you need to come back to me in 30 days with a plan of how you're going to reduce costs by 15%. And, and, you know, when people came back and they produced a plan and they didn't get to 15%, he would say, go back. If you don't come back with 15%, your job is going to be the, the additional 15%. So he was very, very forceful on this, and, and he got what he wanted. Uh, he cut costs 15%. And after it was over, a few years after that, they, someone asked him, you know, why 15%? Did you do some kind of, you know, rigorous analytics to decide that that was the right number? Or did you look at the competition? And, and, and he basically said, nah, you know, I thought 20 was too much, 10 was too little. So I decided 15 was the right number. Anyway, they found out that it was about the right number. In some groups, it was too much. And they'd really taken out a lot of muscle that he needed to replace people. But... Uh, it was held up as a great example of this ability to set stretch goals in the organization. So that's one story. The second story is a CEO uh, of a publishing company. And in 50 years they'd been in publishing, they never had one bestseller. <laughs> and so uh, the CEO uh, went to kind of the end of the year meeting and, and she asked her employees, she said, does anybody have a goal or uh, for the next year that you'd like to share? Something we ought to do. And one of our employees raised a hand and he said, I think we ought to have a best-selling book. And the CEO thought, well, wow, that's crazy. We've never had, we've been in business 50 years, never had a best-selling book. That's impossible. But being a good CEO, she said, well, what do the rest of you think? And they talk about this for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, they made a decision. And the decision was, Let's have two best-selling books. <laughs> mm. Okay. And everybody was like, wow. But she said it was interesting what happened because that night everybody went home and they had this nugget in their brain. And, and it's like two best-selling books. How are we going to do this? And she said the next morning when they came to work, ideas were just popping everywhere. And, and people were talking about this. And they, they talked about it for a week. And after a week, a, a plan was hatched. And within a year, they have two best-selling books. Why? Because they set a stretch goal. It was a very collaborative effort. And so the question is, how do you do it? And which is the best approach? <laughs> so Jack, let's yeah. talk about that. So this is the other kind of dimension that we want to present to you. So in addition to the one we've already talked about, the second dimension is uh, 
is your is your leaning toward being autocratic or very directive versus being highly collaborative and having stretch goals kind of bubble up from underneath. Uh, the, the notion of autocracy and highly directive behavior is, you know, it's the manager's job to give people solutions. It's, it's you know, people want direction. They want to be told what to do. Uh, and that my job as a leader is to make sure that people are clear about what's what's their job and when what's the timetable and what's the best thing for them to be doing right now. And, and helping other people means giving them more direction and guidance. On the other side, on the, the, the flip side of that coin is the, the more collaborative uh, leader uh, who thinks that it's better if people kind of struggle coming up with their own solutions and that people prefer figuring things out for themselves. And, and you can see then the other kind of elements of collaboration. So which of those two approaches do you find yourself leaning toward? And what, what is the, the, the optimum approach? Uh, we all, we've all seen situations where the highly directive leader uh, finds that people kind of can revolt against stretch goals that are given to them. Uh, on the collaborative side, we, we know that uh, in an effort to achieve consensus, it's very easy for the goals to get watered down and the stretch goals kind of vanish. Uh, and a leader kind of uh, then ends up forcing people to accept stretch goals and then they therefore lose their, their collaborative uh, style of, of leadership. And I guess the, the message we would have uh, for you is that, again, there seems to be a time and a place for each of them. And it is the, it is the combination of these, of these behaviors that seems to be best. Uh, you know, I saw this play out in an organization with whom I was doing some consulting. Uh, a new CEO had been brought in. Uh, the charge from the board was that he, he created a, a fair amount of change in the organization. He worked very hard with the existing team of leaders in the organization to, to kind of implement those changes. And most people went along with it, but there were two, two pretty senior people who just fought it tooth and nail all the way. He worked with them. He kind of uh, coached with them. Months went by. And finally, he said, okay, I've had it. Uh, and he sort of publicly executed them in the sense that they were, they were fired in a very public way. And it was very clear that it was because they had not really jumped on board what was clearly the new strategy. And I, I guess the, and that was very successful. People, everyone in the organization said, oh, okay, this is really serious. We are going to do this. And things went pretty smoothly after that. And, and the, I guess the lesson I learned was, you know, there's a time to be collaborative and there's a time to be a little more directive. And it is that, that the push me, pull you animal kind of taking turns uh, at, at leading that really seems to work well. Yeah, I think the worst option there, Jack, is when people want to be autocratic, but they want to look make make it look like they're collaborative. <laughs> so, and and everybody knows it's not right. Yeah. But you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, if if the the CEO that was trying to get the fifteen percent, if he would have taken it to the group and said, "What percent should we cut?" They would have never they would have never agreed to fifteen percent. And, and so what we did in the self-assessment is we've measured these two attributes. Are you more of a protector, a protector or more of a challenger? Do you tend to be more autocratic? Is that, is that your tendency a little bit? Uh, or are you more, do you like to be more collaborative? One of the things I've noticed in the data, interesting, Jack, is that today with a lot of people working from home and, and not working in the office, that they've slid around a little more autocratic because they have to make decisions on their own and, and things like that. But you can see in your, in your results there, it's a minus seven for protector, plus seven for a challenger, uh, you know, and, and a score, a low score around two, one, zero, one, two, something like that. 
that's going to be, a, you know, you do both. And the autocratic collaborative, again, minus seven to plus seven on the challenger. So which, uh, which do you tend to do uh, and, and what do you tend to do more of? And the autocratic versus collaborative style is, is interesting. Jack, w which works best in your view? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I certainly think just in, in certainly over the span of my career, uh, I've seen a real shift. Uh, away from uh, autocratic, highly directive leadership styles. Uh, so I, I think in general, uh, if the stretch goal is, is widely accepted and embraced by people, then obviously a collaborative style will yield the best results. And sometimes you'll find the group will set a higher, like your Yeah, like the example where where the the group itself said, "Let's do two books." Uh, they would have never come to that. No, uh, higher than the one that the, by himself or herself have proposed. But yeah. if there's resistance to the stretch goal, achieving that goal may require a bit of a push, and a, a more directive approach may be required for it to happen. So when when you cannot get widespread agreement on a stretch goal then you may get sort of active resistance or, or malicious compliance where people just do specifically what you told them to do and nothing more, nothing less. Uh, but they're not really committed. And so uh, maybe all stretch goals don't require widespread agreement, but they obviously work better uh, when there is general acceptance. And so the, one of the jobs of the, of the leader, we think, is to, is to inspire people, motivate them, uh, to, to be the, the polia uh, head on, the, on the, uh, the leading animal there. <laughs> I don't know how you tell the difference between the polia or the pusher. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we did have some data on this. We have uh, quite a lot of data, 10,000 leaders, where we looked at the ratings. And if you look by kind of management level, uh, some people would think, well, top managers are going to be more autocratic, but but they no, they tend to be more collaborative, you know, and 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 uh, you can see that uh, that that's the collaborative end, and then uh, on the uh, age, uh, you'd think, well, who's more collaborative? It's older people; they tend to be, uh, you know, more more kind of autocratic. Well, it's actually the younger people that are more autocratic when you look at the data that way. So it's interesting uh, just how the data looks. Jack, Jack tell us it about yeah. what, is the, what is a BHAG? Yeah, so a few years back, uh, two authors, uh, Jim Collins and Jerry Porras, both at Stanford University, uh, wrote this uh, very popular book called Built to Last. Uh, and one of the one of the terms that they coined in this book was the notion of a BHAG goal. So, what is this big, hairy, audacious goal? And and, and he, the, the the two authors, uh, Jim and Jerry, were were two of the early kind of pioneers in in uh, advancing this idea that people really do enjoy. And, and they're highly motivated by a very, uh, you know, audacious, uh, dramatic uh, goal. And so then, then came the question of what do leaders do to help the people with whom they work accept such a, you know, a BHAG, you know, and, and that's, that's where we, we go next. Uh, our research showed that there were four fundamental behaviors that indeed elevate setting stretch goals. And those four behaviors you see on, on the screen. Um, and so we're gonna talk about each one of them just to, uh, briefly. Uh, the first one, drive for results, which would kind of be the back to the push, uh, Many times stretch goals need a push, both to get started and to get them, get them over the finish line. Uh, 
it's been it's been taught for a long time that people try to maintain some homeostasis or equi equilibrium, and that a stretch goal does push people a little bit uh, off balance. Uh, but if we, we if we can help people identify a significant change that would make a big difference in the effectiveness of their organization, and then very squarely focus on accomplishing that, that is the kind of push that seems to be highly effective in helping people see the, the beauty of a, of a BHAG, uh, a, a big goal. And you know, the push is the start, isn't it, Jack? It's, 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 it's kind of that thing and, and, and it gets you started. But if you only push and you don't pull, you don't get the inspiration, you don't get the excitement, you don't bring in that part of it, this becomes hard work, not inspiring. And, and so, you know, this, this ability to then create the pull, you know, the, the excitement that it goes along with this, the desire uh, that people have to work hard, to make a difference, to do something that nobody's done before, to, to, to go to a place where nobody else has been. I, I mean, that, that is a critical element. And, and all push and no pull makes a manager kind of a jerk. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I, I was going to say Jack. Uh, I went in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway. Uh, yeah. One of the one of the, the specific behaviors that is very very helpful for for leaders is the notion of of joint problem solving. So nothing brings people together more powerfully than when you can come together uh, and and mutually analyze and look for alternatives and choose what you think is the best one and move forward on, on solving some challenging problem. And so when you encounter problems, you can always work harder, but success comes when you find a way to work smarter. And that generally is the outcome of an effective problem solving approach uh, between a manager and, and, and with his or her people. And the last one is strategic perspective. And, and it is really the base, the essence of sort of why are we going there? How does this help us be successful in the future? What does this do to make us more successful? And it's possible that this BHAG, this stretch goal, really changes the strategy and the direction. So clarity about where we're going is really critical here in terms of helping people understand this whole thing. So what we did in the self-assessment is we gave you an opportunity to show your preference for these four different companion behaviors. And your preference really is your excitement or energy around doing these things. We found that oftentimes there's a correlation between your preference and your effectiveness. So the first thing we're measuring here is your preference again, the high score is a plus 12, the lowest possible score is a minus four. And so that would show you kind of, you can see here, uh, this person has a low preference on inspires and motivates and a little bit of a kind of a lower preference on strategic perspective, but high preference on drive for results and solving problems. Now, we then looked at your effectiveness. And so, you know, there's an interesting correlation here where you sort of look at this and you say, gee, the high two high scores are in results and solving problems. And then the lower scores are on strategic perspective and inspires and motivates others. So this should give you some insight into where you might want to go and to just give you a sense of, well, how does my score match up? We've shown you data from 110,000 leaders and what their average scores are on this, on their self ratings here. And so you can see if you're above or below average, just to get a sense, have I overrated myself there or have I underrated myself on, on these four characteristics? So the question we start off with is, well, so what do I do with this? 
And what we wanted to show you is that, it, you know, if you're below average on all four of these things, all, all four of these companion behaviors, your ability to set stretch goals at the, is at about the 20th percentile. If you are above average on one of the four, it goes to the 38th. If you're above average on two, 51st, three, 63rd. And if you're above average on all four, you're at the 81st percentile on your ability to set stretch goals. So there's this really clear connection between these four behaviors and your ability to, to kind of set stretch goals. And using this kind of, well, what am I bad at uh, uh, logic there, that's typically how people think of it. And, and we're gonna kind of explore this a little bit more, but, but that's one way to go about this is to focus on, well, what am I not so good at? A second way would be to say, well, wonder if I was really great at one of these. Well, if I just did one well, my overall average effectiveness would be at the 76th percentile, two well, 86, three well, 92nd, okay? So you can, you can use a building strengths philosophy here for this, but I wanna give you a big, big yabat. Yeah, <laughs> and here's my yabat. Yeah, if you have a fatal flaw in any one of these, anyone, your average effectiveness in setting stretch goals is at the 11th percentile. So not doing any one of these wells just kills your effectiveness, just really makes uh, uh, this very difficult and, and you're not gonna be successful. So as you think about that piece, is there any of these that you're just terrible at? Because this is saying these are all pretty important. They're all very helpful. And as you think about this whole idea of setting stretch goals, it starts off with the push, right? I mean, usually if you think about it, to get somebody to set stretch goals, they need a bit of push. And, and people aren't going to kind of always be naturally drawn to it. So there needs to be some push. And that needs to be followed by the poll. Why are we doing this? What's it gonna get us? How are we gonna get there? Stretch goals really require a new level of performance. And what that's gonna create is some problems. And you've gotta solve those problems. Don't ignore them, don't run over them, fix them. Fix those problems and then be really clear about here's where we're headed. Here's how we're gonna get there. That's the optimum process. And as you think about these four things working together, it just makes so much sense in terms of helping you to be better at setting stretch goals. Earlier in our session today, we said that one of our objectives was that you would leave with some ideas, some one thing that you might want to work on. And so let us just uh, take a moment and have you think with us about what how you might go about making that selection. Uh, are any one of those companion behaviors, the, the, the four that we talked about, are, are those a fatal flaw? In, in other words, are one of those something that you do kind of not, not well at all? Um, maybe the second question would be, which of those four behaviors, if improved, would make the most significant impact on your, on your current job uh, and, and, and your performance in your current job. Uh, third question for you to kind of muse about, I guess, is to uh, think about where your, where your energy, where your passion lies. Which of those uh, are, are, are things that you would really be uh, excited about working on and, and, and making better? So here, they, here are these, these four uh, behaviors, uh, and we would invite you to kind of just apply those three approaches to saying, okay, would I be better if I worked on my driving for results? Would I be benefited more from working on my ability to inspire and motivate people? Uh, if I worked on becoming a better problem solver and jointly meeting with my team and, and finding solutions to problems, or would my working on my 
ability to take the big picture, to think of the, the broader macro view of my company and its industry and the market and what's happening, uh, if I became more strategic, would that have the biggest impact? You, you know, Jack, you yeah, I, was, I was looking at the, the, the data that we'd gathered prior to the, the uh, webinar here from people that had done the assessment early and top managers, uh, their, their strongest preference was for strategic perspective, where are we going? And their lowest preference was for drive for results, which is interesting. Uh, and again, the, the, the individual contributors, uh, they, they went the same direction on that. They, they oh, said, okay. yeah, which is interesting. So let's see, you know, what the results come out on. Yeah. That. So would you all kind of just see which, just indicate what your current thinking about which of those four would be of most benefit to you. So just, um, Give All right, oh, uh, here we go, here we same go. Thing, same thing is true here, although not by not by a big, no, no, there are two equally. Uh, yeah. Drivers and motivates is uh, equal to focusing on strategic perspective. And I'm, I'm excited a lot of people said drive for results. I mean, that's the starting process, you know, that kind of, <laughs> do that, get yeah. that push going there. Yeah. Right, so that's important. Wow, thank you, okay. So um, as you think about this, um, what about your action plan, Jack? Yeah. So we, uh, as you, when you complete the, uh, the, the, the feedback at the end of this uh, webinar, you'll have available, made, made to you available, uh, our development guide, which has some very specific suggestions about things that you can do in each of those four areas. So we would encourage you to, to do that and to kind of uh, get access to that uh, development guide, which we think can really help you uh, in your own quest. To and again, yeah, ac perspective. action plans that, you know, get go from general, I'm gonna do this to what are you specifically gonna do and that, really helps you be more specific about it. Um, again, uh, on the last section on your effectiveness, we did ask you to self-rate your effectiveness on setting stretch goals. And, and so this gives you a good sense about how you did on that competency. Now, we, we have found that self-ratings are directionally accurate about 75% of the time. <laughs> Okay, 25% of the time, you either overrate yourself, I mean, you think you're great at it, and others don't, you're not, or the, you underrate yourself. And, and so, you know, the only way you can get a, a really accurate rating here is with 360 feedback. And Trace is going to give you a chance to do that. And, you know, we, we're going to give you an offer there. But uh, if you look at this chart here, and if you look at your score on your self-rating, what we did here was we, we correlated, and this is 100,000 liters, so it's, it's a large data set and things average out. But if we correlated the self-scores, and you can see them in parentheses there, if you look at your self-score and put it on that graph, you can see how others rated you. Uh, how other people rated you, and this is based on 100,000 liters. So you can kind of see how effective am I? Are you at where you want to be on setting stretch goals? Remember, this is the number two most differentiating competency. This thing can really help you. And I think every leader ought to know better how to set stretch goals. So Jack, one final quote. Yeah, the, the legendary CEO of General Electric um, made this, this comment that you see on the screen, set stretch goals, don't ever settle for mediocrity. The key to stretch is to reach for more than you think is possible. Don't sell yourself short by thinking that you'll fail. Jack Welch. <laughs> and he was, he was great at those. Tracy, we're gonna turn this over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jack and Joe, and to all the participants. Your chat questions and comments were, were plentiful and much appreciated. If you didn't receive an answer, um, we will follow up shortly if we left anything hanging for you. Um, 
what you heard about today was a sample of our approach to leadership development, whether for a specific competency or behavior or overall leadership effectiveness. First, we help define what extraordinary looks like. We provide a way to measure it through a 360 degree or multi-rater assessment. And then those results provide direction about which strengths should be the focus for ongoing development. Last, we sustain the development effort by making it easy to integrate into your everyday workflow. As we look at the next screen, if you would like to determine how good you are at setting stretch goals, as well as determining your overall effectiveness, you can do so by taking advantage of this special offer for the special price listed. When you complete the exit survey, you can indicate that you'd like to be contacted with more information. And you'll also get an opportunity to download the development guide that Jack mentioned. As we finish again, we would love to hear from you. Please take a minute to provide the feedback. The survey link is posted in the chat box. Uh, once the webinar ends, the survey will automatically open. And if for some reason it doesn't open automatically, please go to bit.ly forward slash ZF dash M-A-Y. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next month and have a wonderful holiday weekend.